came to Pennsylvania, and they were all set to move to Nazareth, but they couldn't. Nazareth was founded in 1740 by a sect of persecuted German religious zealots known as Moravians. Moravians were more progressive than, say, the Mennonites or the Amish, except back then when it came to family. They were very commercial, they brewed beer, but family was important to them, and Nazareth was actually a closed religious commune. And if you were not born and bred Moravian, you could not spend the night in Nazareth. There was actually an inn. Right on the outskirts of Nazareth, there was an inn on the outskirts of Bethlehem, and that's where the commercial traders would stay. They could go into town, you know, trade during the day, but at night they had to stay out of town. So my family bought a piece of property right up on the top of this hill, and that's their Cherry Hill location where they lived and worked from 1839 until in 1858 the town incorporated itself, let in the outsiders, and by then, of course, my family had converted to be, to be Moravian, because it was kind of the only religious game in town, and moved downtown to the corner of North and Main. Built a house and built what we, what we call the beginning of the old factory. It was much more convenient also, rather than having to be out of town every time you want to go to town, hitch up the horses and the wagon and spend half a day just going down to the post office. <clears throat> but more importantly is the transformation that the Martin guitar was going through. And as I mentioned, the, the premise of the book is that CF was acutely aware of what was going on around him relative to demand from players for guitars. I also think he came to the realization that the Stauffer style guitar was extremely delicate. You think about America, you think about immigrants coming to America, yes, some of them came to New York and stayed. But more often than not, the port of entry was a jumping off point to go somewhere else. And if you wanted to take a guitar with you, it had to be durable enough to survive the ride on your Conestoga wagon, or on horseback, or later by train, or whatever. And I know from personal experience, uh, not that long ago, we made a, a very authentic reproduction of a Stauffer guitar to dedicate a, an anniversary. I can't even remember what the anniversary was. And we shipped it out to the NAMM show in Anaheim. And on the way, it broke. So. I imagine he may have encountered the same thing. The customer, you know, contacts him, Mr. Martin, the guitar you sold me broke on my way to Cincinnati or whatever. We also know, because of the research done uh, for this book, that players were now really paying attention to guitars that were coming out of Spain, not Northern Europe, Southern Europe and that the market was moving in that direction and CF, wanting to continue his career, said maybe I need to take a closer look at these Spanish guitars. What he discovered was they were more appropriate for the type of music that was being played. They were relatively more durable except for the fact that because they were made in the southern coastal region of Spain, particularly around Cadiz, the guitars themselves did not travel well to the northeast part of America. And today, while we're filming this, the temperature in Nazareth is zero degrees. I don't think it goes below freezing very often in southern Spain. So imagine the trauma that these delicately made Spanish guitars were going through. CF, cabinet maker, Germanic mindset, said I can build a better mousetrap. And that's what he set out to do. And you, know, you take a look at these guitars and you take a look at the Stafford guitars and you go, something very significant happened in that very short period of time when he said, I'm going to make an American version of a Spanish guitar. I'm not going to make a copy of the guitar I learned how to build from Johann Stauffer. So some of the funny things, one of the funniest things he did, he incorporated, of course, the Spanish heel, the simple and elegant rectangular headstock that is today a registered trademark of the Martin Guitar Company. If you're familiar with the way the Spanish build guitars, they actually incorporate the neck block into the neck. And they cut a couple of slots on either side of that block and they build the body around the neck. An extremely awkward way to build a guitar because from that point on, you're committed. You're committed to working with this thing about this big. He, using the cabinet maker's tool or technique of the dovetail, and we still do this today, built the body and the neck separately. 
he would then fit them together with the dovetail. But on the Spanish guitar, some of them had a little, what was called a foot. And that was part of the, the structure of that Spanish block neck um, con configuration. He put in a fake foot. It had no purpose other than to give you the impression that he was building it just like the Spanish did, which I think is kind of kind of cool. Um, so, top bracing, very important, possibly the most important issue guitar builders have to deal with when they're building an acoustic guitar. Back braces, pretty straightforward. A couple of transverse braces, you want to hold the back secure, get that sound up and out of the sound hole. Early, and I imagine even possibly today, I've seen them, you know, 100 years ago, and we know before that, occasionally guitar builders would run transverse braces across the top. Hey, it's quick and dirty, but it did nothing for the sound. And in fact, it actually was detrimental to the sound. So in Spain, there was an interest in continuing to improve the sound of the guitar. And the way they approached that was to build a top that had support with a, with a transverse brace up here below the sound hole and then smaller braces fanning out called fan bracing. And the, the fellow that truly refined it is Mr. Torres, but it, it, you can see in examples of Spanish guitars how different luthiers were trying to figure out what's the best configuration to get some braces on there, to hold it down, and still allow it to move. Because that's the trick. You want, it, you want it to stay together, but you want it to move at the same time. And so what came out of that, and again, the, the research for the book draws the conclusion that if you were tying the strings onto the bridge. You had pretty much free reign down there underneath the top. You could do whatever you wanted to suit the purpose of structure and tone. Once you began to secure the strings with a bridge pin, you were now constrained by the fact that you were going to drill six holes in the top of the guitar. And if you had these little fans down there, and back in the day, guitar building required really good eyesight and intuition in terms of where you start and where you end. In the middle, you have to make sure that everything you're doing is ultimately going to align itself so the guitar plays properly. And so you may have to make course corrections along the process of the manufacture that would cause the bridge perhaps to shift a little bit. And then the next thing you know, you're drilling through the top and you drill right through one of your fan braces. That's not a good thing. So CF ultimately pushed the fans way out, crisscrossed them, put a little maple plate underneath where the bridge is to give some security to the ball end, and eliminated that issue of those fans being in the way. One of the guitars that is not here is actually at the Met right now, and it is one of the earliest examples of a Martin guitar with X bracing. Again, not documented. CF didn't keep a diary, but we truly believe that he did invent and sort of refine the X brace that pretty much every one of my competitors today uses 